Good morning and welcome as we join together to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. <coughs> Excuse me, I choked up even saying it. Uh, but it is a beautiful day today because the Lord Jesus still reigns as King, and K King of kings and Lord of lords. Our sins are still forgiven because of his sacrifice for us and he lives and reigns and intercedes for us at the right hand of God. So it is a beautiful day today to gather together. This morning as we, uh, as we come together, we have uh, a number of things going on in the life of the church. So uh, one, uh, we've got our pizza and pumpkin this Saturday at 11 o'clock. Uh, pumpkin decorating and carving, face painting, crafts, games, pizza. It'll be lots of fun for the kids. So uh, please remember that this Saturday at 11 o'clock. Also in your bulletin, there is a covenant card. Uh, I know we don't have a long history of doing these kinds of commitment cards. And so I just wanted to say a word about why we're doing this. Why do we do this? So um, as I've mentioned, stewardship is a much larger uh, topic than just money, although that's what I'm focusing on in this little mini-series. Mini it, it encompasses everything because everything we have is given to us as a trust from God. We're blessed in countless ways. Our health, our resources, um, our time, our talents, all of these things are gifts to us from God. And so we have three covenants that are reflected on our covenant card. One is a covenant to grow, and that's by spending time in God's Word, finding a place to serve, and so forth uh, in the second part of the covenant. And then finally, uh, my covenant to give. And so what we're asking is that you would prayerfully consider what your response will be for the coming year. And next Sunday, as an act of worship, we're going to receive uh, these cards and uh, we will demonstrate our commitments to God and our gratitude for all he has blessed us with. So that's a little bit about uh, why we're doing these cards. It's an act of worship. It's a step in our spiritual growth. If you happen to be sitting on an aisle seat, if you will take the opportunity to uh, sign in on the pew register and pass it down your aisle so that everyone on your aisle has an opportunity to register their attendance as well. We would appreciate that. And are there any announcements that anyone has that need to be lifted up that I haven't mentioned? Anyone have anything? Yes, Dave. Um, no, 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 no. Mom, A praise. Absolutely. That's a good thing, David. Praise the Lord for church and family. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else with an announcement? Okay. So uh, this morning we have some folks that are planning on joining the church. We had uh, five persons that joined the church in our previous service. And we've got three scheduled for today, but I'm not sure everybody's here. So Beulah Clark, I know Beulah is here. Uh, William and Sandra Arnold, are they here? Yes, yes, you are. I didn't even see you over there. All right, if you guys will come forward and feel free to bring a hymnal with you. And congregation, if you'll turn with me to page 34 in the front of the hymnal. Page 34. And come on up front, if you will. Uh, Beulah and the Arnolds, if you would. Am I saying that right? Is it Arnold? Okay. Didn't know if it might have that French influence. All right. Come right on up front. And I'll tell you what, let's just make it easy. And if you'll stand down here, that way we won't have to negotiate any stairs. All right. And we're on page 34, congregation. We're going to skip around a little bit, but if you will just follow me, we'll all get there together. And so I'm going to ask uh, the three of you, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And if you do, say, I do. 
Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And if you'll say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And if you will say, I do. Now we're going to skip down to question number six. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? And if you will, say, I will. will. All right. And number eight, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? Okay, now we're going to fast forward to page 38, top of the page. Just two more questions. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as members of this congregation here at Duck United Methodist, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if you will, say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And Beulah, it is my pleasure to present you with your membership certificate and to be the first to officially welcome you as a member here at Duck United Methodist Church. Welcome. And Sandra, Thanks. welcome. And Bill, Thanks welcome. Thanks for saying, Bill. <laughs> welcome. Would you join me in making these folks feel welcome to our church family? Thank you. Are there any um, prayer concerns over on this side first? Yes, we've got several. Ruth, thank you. Okay, Claire, David. Okay. Sharon, yes. Dorothy Payne. Peggy and Mary. Karen, thank you. Anybody else? On, yes? Jill. Gerald. All right. Anybody over here? Yes. Johnson. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Corrine, thank you. Anybody else on this side? Choir, I think I left you out earlier service, didn't I? Yes. Kevin, Kevin thank you. Dick. Dick, okay. Alex. Alex, thank you. And we have two women from our church that are attending the walk to Emmaus this weekend. So we want to lift up prayers for uh, Debbie Lucas and also for Carol Powell. They will be finishing up later this afternoon and coming home. And I trust that this has been a very, very spiritually powerful weekend for them. And So we'll pray for them too. So let's uh, join together our hearts and minds as we go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather on this day. And though it is 
rainy and windy outside, we're glad to be able to come inside where we know the warmth of your love is here to greet us and to meet us and to envelop us. And we thank you today for the opportunity to come and to return thanks to you for your many and varied blessings. We also thank you for the opportunity to come and pray for those that we have lifted aloud and those that we lift in silence today. Lord, we pray that your blessings would fall upon those that, who need your help, uh, those that are sick, those, Lord, who are distressed in one way or another, those that may be traveling, uh, those who have particular need. And we are thankful that you are aware already of all of our needs and are able to meet them according to your riches and glory. Lord, we also lift up uh, Debbie Lucas and we lift up Carol Powell to you today and all the women that are attending the walk to Emmaus this weekend. We pray that you will have shown and demonstrated to them in powerful ways the love that you have for them, your grace which is overwhelming and sufficient for times such as these. Lord, bless us for being together here today to worship you in spirit and truth. We pray all of these prayers in Jesus' name, amen. And let me invite you to stand as we join together in our call to worship, which you may find printed in your bulletin. Praise the Lord, O servants of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And our first hymn is found on page 421, Make Me a Captive Lord. Out of the depths we cry to God in our suffering and in our pain. Out of the depths God cries to us asking us to repent, to return to God with our whole hearts, to admit our sin 
and to accept forgiveness. So let us pray together our prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Holy One, we long to be faithful stewards of your abundant grace. Forgive us when we stumble over pride, when our words and actions are not guided by love. Sometimes, many times, O oh God, our efforts fail. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And let us pray together the prayer of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, watch this mission moment. Good steward means to take care of all of the gifts that I have been given, whether it's taking care of my garden or whether it's taking care of the finances that I have. Um, it's to maintain them, it's to make them grow and help them grow. For me, being a good steward is really about trusting God and knowing that all of the gifts that we have and enjoy are from Him. Well, stewardship is uh, having the attitude that God owns everything we have and that He gives us the opportunity to manage that. And it's more than just finances, it's our time and our talent and all of our possessions. Giving is part of a spiritual discipline or a spiritual practice that we have agreed to uh, to do since we started ministry, actually. Um, so every church that we've been a part of, we wanted to invest in that church because we believe in the ministries that that church is about in the, in the church, but also in the community and the world at large. So I, as a child, had a... I was used to giving every Sunday. We used to get the little envelopes and my parents would have, I got an allowance every week and I had a little Tupperware container to put my allowance in and I had my budget. And I remember like 10 cents for church or five cents for church and I'd put a dime or a nickel in there. And I used to, as a kid, every week, I would bring my envelope to church. I got in that habit. And I kind of got out of that habit until I came to Duck Church. And then, you know, I would, not that I wouldn't give, but I wouldn't give regularly, and I wouldn't think about what I was giving. I would just throw something on the plate. And when I saw what the congregation here does and how so many people do so much to serve, that I was just inspired to give to something that was so worthy of giving to. I think by giving with other believers, um, kind of pooling our resources, uh, it's a much broader reach than we might be able to do individually. As a child, I learned that God would always provide. As an adult, I had an experience where I was taking the family on a relatively expensive trip and an unknown insurance policy 
check appeared in the mail. About eight years ago, we didn't know that we would ever own a home and that God has blessed us with the ability to have uh, the finances through saving and inheritance that we have. We now own our own home. We have a lot of financial prayers because somebody got the crazy idea to open a restaurant. <laughs> Yes. yes. So, <laughs> a lot of financial planning. Yeah, in a so, you know, it was honestly, and, and we joke about it, but it wasn't a joke. Like it was a little bit traumatic for us to go through what we went through, and it was probably in some of our deepest times of financial stress that we actually both sort of, I think, independently decided it was time to tithe and really trust God. And if we really did that, <clears throat> it was going to be something that our giving would come back to us. And um, I mean, I'm here to say that it has. I mean, we really, ever since that point, I think we, we gave to the point where it hurt, it's made a real difference in our life. Well, we take our income, my income, Chris's income, and we um, we add it together, and then we start at 10%, and then add a percentage, um, what we agree upon, um, as what we would give for the year, and uh, that's what we do have, have been doing since we've been married. Well, it's interesting because I not only do it once a year, and when I get my income tax return, I always look and um, look at the percentages and what I should be giving and divide everything up. And then I look periodically. I like to look at things when I get the quarterly statements from the church and see if I'm maintaining and how my income compares to what I've been giving. So it's pretty much a once, in a, once a year thing, but it's also spot check throughout the year. Each of us come with um, each of us come with our own special gifts. We we come as a gifted congregation marked by abundance. So let us make our offering to God as we worship Him through tithes and offerings.
Oh God, of the many spectacular gifts we give in thanksgiving, we pray that you will take our gifts offered, at times timidly and cautiously, blessing and sanctifying all that we give. Let your kingdom grow and spread around us. This we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. And let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Friends, let us join together in professing what it is that we believe as we join together our voices in reading the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you'll remain standing, our next hymn is found on page 512, Stand By Me.
please be seated. We're going to be looking at one verse as a springboard for a number of verses that we'll look at today, but we're going to start with Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and this is from the Good News Translation. Remember the words the Lord Jesus himself said, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. Do you really believe that? I mean, that there's more happiness in giving than there is in receiving? Happiness is based on living generously. Let me share with you some key words that we find in the Bible. The word believe and all of its variants like believer or believing is used 275 times in the Bible. The word pray and all of its variants is used 371 times. The word love, lover, loves, or loving is used 714 times. And the word giving or give is used 2,162 times. So my question is, where does the Bible put the most emphasis? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? It's on giving. The Bible is a book about giving. It's not something that's just tacked on to the Christian life. It is the essence of Christian living. Jesus was the ultimate giver. The Bible says, give and it will be given to you for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Give and it will be given. We've, we've all heard that. So my question today, and maybe your question as well, is what do I get back? Give and it will be given, the scripture says. So if I give, what do I get back? Well, there are seven things, seven benefits of becoming a generous person that I want to share with you today. Number one, giving makes me more like God. God is a giver. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave. Everything you have is a gift from God. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. To be like God, you've got to learn to become a giver. Number two, giving draws me closer to God. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where is your heart this morning? It's wherever your treasure is. If it's in a boat, a house, a business, your clothes, your children, your grandchildren, your family, your career, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Every time I give to God, it moves me a little bit closer to Him. It draws me closer to Him because that's where my treasure is. And God is much more interested in raising disciples than He is in raising dollars. Benefit number three. Giving is a victory over materialism. You know, there's a lie on TV that you see all the time that says happiness can be purchased. You know, life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. If I can just get a certain thing, then I'll be happy. We get more and more. And if that were true, then obviously the people with the most would be the most happy. But we know that that's not true. You know, you make a living out of what you get. You make a life out of what you give. When the world says more, giving says give away. It breaks the grip of materialism. The scripture says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present world, and by the way, that's all of us. If you live in America, you're rich. Command those who are rich in this present world not to put your hope in wealth, but to put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, it's not wrong to enjoy nice things. The Bible says, God says, it's, it's okay to enjoy. He gives us everything for our enjoyment. But he does not make us prosper simply so we can spend it all on ourselves. 
He says, command them to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You make a life by giving. Deuteronomy 14 says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. That's why Hayden, Satan, Hayden, same thing. <laughs> That's why Satan hates giving and he fights it so much. Benefit number four, giving strengthens my faith. Now, God uses dollars to test our faith and to strengthen our faith. God said in the book of Malachi, test me, try me, prove me, I dare you. You give and see if I won't bless you in return. It says that there is a way to prove there is a God. There is only one way, it says, that you can prove God, and that's through giving. God says, I dare you. Trust me in this. Test me. See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven so much so that you will not be able to contain it. There are lots of promises in the Bible. And there are more promises centered around giving than anything else in the Bible. With every promise, though, there's a premise. God says, you give, and I'll give to you. And we often say, well, God, you bless me, and then I'll give. God says, no, you prime the pump first. You first. Why? Because giving requires faith. Giving Tests, tests my faith and it strengthens it. Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income and he will fill your barns to overflowing. That is a promise of God. Benefit number five for living a generous life. Giving is an investment for eternity. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead by investing it in people who are going to be there. Every time you give, it is an eternal investment. Jesus said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So how do you do that? How do you store up treasures in heaven? Well, 1 Timothy tells us. It says this, give happily to those in need and always be ready to share whatever God has given you. By doing this, you will be storing up real treasure for yourselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. Let me just say, it is a protected investment and it gets great rates. God says, every time I give, it's an investment into the future. Benefit number six, giving blesses me in return. I always get more out of it than I give. Proverbs 22, 9 says, a generous man will himself be blessed. Psalm 112 says in verses 5 and 6, good will come to him who is generous and a righteous man will be remembered forever. What do you want to be remembered for? Calvin Coolidge said, no man is ever honored for what he received in life. He's honored only for what he gave. The Bible says that we are blessed in return when we're generous with others. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Have you learned this secret? Have you learned that whatever you give out is what you're going to get back in life? If you give out criticism, then you're going to get criticism back. If you give out gossip, you're going to get gossip back about you. But if you give out encouragement you're going to get encouragement back. It's a law of life that we reap what we sow, sowing and reaping. We reap what we sow, and the more we give away, the more we get back in blessings. Now, giving makes us like God, and it draws us closer to God. Giving helps us focus on our priorities and, and enables us to put first things first. It blesses me in return. It is an investment for eternity. And number seven, giving makes me happy. It's the source of joy. Jesus said there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. God has taught me to be a giver. By my nature and by your nature, we are selfish. 
God is teaching me to be a giver because it feels so good to give. And people who don't know that are people who have never done it. Now, we talk about giving till it hurts. I want to talk about giving until it feels good because that's the source of joy. God wants us to enjoy being a generous person. The happiest people I know in this world are people who are generous. They're people who give. 1 Chronicles 29.9 says, The people rejoiced for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David also Rejoice greatly. Now, next Sunday is going to be a happy Sunday in the life of our church. It's going to be a big celebration. We're going to celebrate ministry together and we're going to make our giving commitments next week. Now, unfortunately, some people are going to miss out because they don't know how to give with the right attitude. So, in the time that we have left, very briefly, I want to talk with you about how to enjoy an offering. You ever had anybody tell you how to enjoy an offering? Here you go. Number one, give willingly. David said in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 5, he says, I've given all these things. Now who is willing to consecrate himself to the Lord? And in verse 17, he says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity and all these things I've given willingly. In other words, voluntarily. And with honest intent, and I have seen how with joy, how willingly your people here have given to you. You see, giving is a matter of willingness, not wealth. It's an attitude, not an amount. 2 Corinthians 9, 12 says, listen to this very closely. For if the willingness is there, your gift is acceptable according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. He's not saying equal gifts. He's saying equal sacrifice. It's the willingness that makes the difference. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give. That means that you've thought it out, you've planned. It's not spontaneous, not reluctantly or under pressure. Now, I need to say something to you. Uh, God does not believe in pressure giving, and neither do I. God does not believe in guilting people to give, and neither do I. Now, some of you feel pressured just having a Bible study on it, but that's not coming from me if you feel pressure. God says give thoughtfully, give willingly. Here's the second way to enjoy an offering. Give generously. If you really want to be the kind of giver that God is pleased with, give generously. David says in verse 2, with all my resources... I've provided for the temple. He said, I haven't held anything back. And in verse 3, he says, I've given over and above all of these other things. And then in verse 14, he says, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give this generously? 2 Corinthians 8, verses 3 and 4. This just astounds me every time I read this passage. They gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. In other words, these people were begging Paul to take up an offering. I've never served that church that begged the pastor, please, please, please take up an offering. Here's the third way that you can benefit and uh, be excited and joyful about an offering. Give joyfully. And let me just say something. Uh, all of my folks on the, on the finance committee don't stroke out when I say this. I really mean it. If you can't give joyfully, don't give. If you can't give joyfully, don't give. God is interested in your attitude. Give joyfully. I don't know if you're excited about what's going to happen next week when we turn our covenant cards in. I, I know I'm excited, and I know some other people are excited. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, For God loves, what kind of giver? Anybody know? Cheerful giver. Do you know what that word means in Greek? It means hilarious. God loves hilarious Givers, are you hilarious when you give? Or do you say, oh no, here comes the offering plate again. <laughs> In the New Testament times, 
They got excited when they had the offering. In our services in America today, that's the low point of the service. But it says they were hilarious when they gave. They were joyful givers because they wanted to be like Jesus. Number four, give thankfully. Give thankfully. In verse 13, David says uh, in their offering for the temple, Now, our God, we give you thanks. This is uh, still 1 Chronicles 29, uh, 13 and following. Uh, we praise your glorious name, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything we have comes from you, and we've only given you what comes from your hand. That's giving thankfully. It's a privilege to live in America. It's a privilege to live on the Outer Banks. It's a privilege to be part of this great church. And with privilege comes responsibility. God says, be thankful in your giving. Psalm 116 says, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? You see, giving is really an opportunity to give back to God. It's, it's, it's the ability to say, God, I realize I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. I wouldn't have my health. I wouldn't have my family. I wouldn't have my career. I wouldn't have anything. God, I just want to give you something back. And every time that we make a gift, we're saying, thank you, Lord. I just want you to know that I'm grateful for everything you've blessed me with. Number five, and lastly, give expectantly. Give expectantly. You cannot outgive God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That's just the principle of farming. A farmer who wants a harvest knows that he can't just sit around and pray about it. He goes out and he scatters some seed, and the amount of seed that he scatters determines his harvest. If he scatters just a little bit of seed, he's just going to have a little bit of a harvest. But if he scatters a whole lot of seed, then he's going to get a big harvest. And the Bible says that that is true in every area of our life. Whatever you sow, you reap. And you reap in proportion to what you sow. So the question becomes, how big of a harvest do you want? Listen, giving is not a debt that we owe. It is a seed that we sow. It is not an obligation. It is an opportunity to build our faith. Every time you sit down and write out a check for your tithe or put your money in the plate and you turn it in, knowing that that money could go to pay bills or who knows what, that's a test of your faith. Give expectantly. Well, people say, well, when I get more, I'll give more. God says, who are you kidding? You prime the pump. Give expectantly. So what's the starting point? 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, they first gave themselves to the Lord. Now, I'm going to say something else again that my finance folks, just hang with me. God doesn't need your money. God does not need your money. He wants what it represents. God wants you. But God doesn't have you unless he has your money too. Unless you say, God, all of it belongs to you. My time, my money, my energy, my efforts. I'm yours. And that's really what God wants. He wants all of us. He has given all of himself for us. And he wants us to give all of ourselves in return. And friends, when it comes to stewardship, whether it's finance, whether it's time, whether it's talents, abilities, whatever it may be, that is what it's all about. It's about giving ourselves to the Lord. Amen? Amen. So let's stand and sing together our closing hymn. It's found on page 529 this morning. How firm a foundation.
sure to come back next Sunday as we conclude our mini-series on financial stewardship. The message next week will be Take the Risk uh, from Matthew 25, 14 through 30. I hope you'll be here. And now let's receive this blessing. You have been called to serve the Lord with gladness. Go from this place knowing that God's blessings have been poured on you so that you may be a blessing to others. Be at peace and bring the good news of God's love and peace to all whom you meet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.